Good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome everybody to the 2019 AWS Public Sector Summit. My name's Peter Famigetti. I'm one of your room hosts. My colleague, Elsie Harrell, is sitting at the back in a blue AWS shirt. Just want to go through a couple quick housekeeping items. Our emergency exits are at the back. Bathrooms are located out this door here, onto the side, both men's and women's. I just want to remind everybody to put your phones on silent. And if you haven't done so already, please download the AWS app. We'd appreciate your feedback. So all of your sessions will be available on that app for the rest of today and tomorrow. At this time, I want to turn the microphone over to Kyle, one of our solutions architects. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Hey, well, good afternoon, and, and thanks for joining the next 50 minutes with us. My name's Kyle Hart. I'm a solutions architect with AWS, and on stage with me is Joe Foster from NASA Goddard, the cloud, the cloud lead for our, our efforts at Goddard. And so what we're going to talk about for, for the next several minutes here is, is the science mission at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and, and how AWS technologies are enabling Goddard to fulfill that mission as NASA embarks on some tremendous endeavors over the next several years. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Joe to, to lead off and introduce some of the efforts and activities that are happening at Goddard. A lot of you from the area here may have driven past it on your way to Baltimore, but you'll get a much better idea of some of the, the leading edge science that happens at the Goddard Space Flight Center. All right, welcome. Uh, we're going to do a quick video real fast, and then we'll sort of dive into sort of uh, who Goddard is and uh, how, we're, how we're approaching cloud at, at Goddard as a center. At NASA Goddard, we build space telescopes. To explore the evolution of galaxies, stars, and planets that make up our universe. We discover planets around other stars and investigate whether they can support life and what that life might look like. We imagine, then engineer, far-out missions to answer questions about how galaxies and planets formed and evolved over time. At NASA Goddard, we study the sun's dynamic behavior and the space weather that it generates so we can protect astronauts and satellites in space as well as our technology on the ground. At NASA Goddard, we use the data from a constellation of satellites to generate global maps of rain and snow pummeling the Earth. To monitor how greenhouse gases move through the atmosphere. And to model all of the Earth systems to create a dynamic portrait of our planet. We launch small rockets carrying university developed experiments into space. And provide low cost space platforms for testing new instrument concepts and engineering techniques. At NASA Goddard, we ensure every craft is space ready. We blast noise and shake instruments to simulate stresses at launch. We expose them to the unforgiving vacuum of space and to the powerful magnetic fields. At NASA Goddard, we develop and maintain communication links between Earth and spacecrafts in orbit. We evaluate and improve system software to reduce risk in our missions, large and small. Innovation and science never sleep. And new discoveries never get old. At NASA Goddard. Turn my mic on, I guess. So that's a little overview of who we are. Um, I'm going to highlight a little bit about some of the variety of missions and sort of our overall approach to cloud. Um, but as Kyle mentioned, um, NASA Goddard, um, NASA's an interesting place, as you can imagine. Uh, much like DOD, we're sort of a bit decentralized. Each center has a bit of their own uh, nuance. Uh, so at Goddard, uh, we're headquartered in Greenbelt, Maryland, just around the Beltway, uh, right off, first exit off BW Parkway. Um, I'm going to highlight here a, a couple of things, because you'll see um, the, the themes sort of reemerge as we go forward. Uh, but there's about 10,000 people on uh, Goddard, which is, makes us quite large for a center. Um, but as I'll highlight, 48% um, 
advanced degrees. So obviously, as you would expect with NASA, a lot of uh, very smart people who are, are fully capable of doing things themselves and oftentimes think that they want to do things themselves. Uh, one other interesting challenge, like I said, um, even though people hear the word center and they think that it's one physical location, but uh, we are not. We're not actually one physical location. Like I said, the headquarters is in Greenbelt, uh, about uh, 1,300 acres, as you see. Uh, we have our launch facility, Wallops Flight Facility, out on the eastern shore uh, near Assateague and Chincoteague. Uh, we have GIST, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in Manhattan, uh, IVNV, the Independent Validation and Verification Facility out in West Virginia, and of course, uh, White Sands with our um, satellite arrays and uh, Columbia Scientific Balloon Facility in Texas. So as you can imagine, a wide variety of different mission types, a wide variety of different customer needs, and obviously a, a pretty large physical footprint. And specific to the types of missions that we do, um, NASA has sort of four pr predominant science disciplines, and we actually do all four of them at Goddard. Uh, we do astrophysics, heliophysics, earth science, and planetary science, uh, in addition to, like I said, with some of the other launch capabilities, satellite building, as you saw, comm and navigation. So as I've said, wide, wide array of customers, wide array of mission types, uh, wide array of uh, potential user uh, use cases that exist out there. And this is the one that I, I feel like is a bit of an eye chart, um, but I think it highlights sort of the, the depth and breadth of a lot of the missions. Uh, so as you can see, a lot of different satellites on that uh, that Goddard all runs with a wide variety of data types, with a wide, wide a variety of uh, different instruments and different use cases that exist out there. Um, and so, as you can imagine, on the science community and, and in the engineering community, it creates a wide array of different um, needs that exist. So, moving into cloud. So, why, why all this background about sort of who we are and what we're doing? Um, so, one thing that was very interesting, I don't know if, if any of you read my bio, I know some of you know me in here. Um, my position is relatively new. Uh, I started at NASA in uh, September. And you know it's the first full-time cloud program manager that NASA has. And it's partly due to some of these challenges that are sort of uh, themes that I inherited when I started. Uh, a lot of smart people, a lot of them that wanted to do things on their own, a wide variety of different mission needs and mission requirements. Um, and Goddard has decentralized IT. Each of these mission directorates has their own IT department. They all sort of do what they want for the most part. And it's ca caused a lot of challenges to adoption for cloud. Um, both on the security side of the house because what we've ended up with is a bunch of you know what I would call snowflake implementation cases where there's not a lot of standardization. Everybody sort of approaches it in their own way based on their own sets of needs and requirements and based on their own interpretation and understanding of cloud in general. Um, and so sort of down to the third bullet there, um, a lot of the missions that we talk to, you know, they're astrophysicists, they're heliophysicists, they're earth science, earth scientists, they don't necessarily have time to be cloud exports, nor, nor do they want to be. Um, and as I'm sure you, if you sat in the keynote, if you've used AWS for long enough, you know that the pace at which um, commercial cloud providers roll out new services, new features, is, is, is pretty hard to keep up with. It, 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 it in and of itself it tends to be a full-time job. And I'll sort of highlight there at the bottom, right, the IT security team uh, doesn't fully understand cloud for the most part. And so it's caused some unique challenges to adoption because they want to approach it much like the data center. So what we've done, so we've created the, the, a full-time cloud program team. Uh, we're actually in the solutions engineering division under the CIO. Uh, and as I sort of highlight to people, um, I know Kyle hears this from me uh, every week when he's there, um, you know, our, our job is not migrating the data center. Uh, I, I actually don't really know what's in there, nor do I really care. Um, a lot of what we aim to do is provide a streamlined and um, efficient and sort of fluid, secure way for missions to consume cloud services. Uh, so to put it in sort of what I would consider cloud speak, you know, we are sort of the infrastructure broker, and we are actually looking for those um, SaaS providers for the most part, like government software teams that have their own idea of what value is to their end customer. And that's who we're partnered with. Um, you know, I, I sort of threw the, the bottom bullet on there too. Um, you know, I came to NASA from the intelligence community, and so um, there's a lot of experience that I have there. 
and the theme that if you heard Sue Gordon talk earlier today, uh, she used to be the deputy director of the agency I was at, uh, there's a motto that we sort of used as part of the adoption there, which is do in common what's commonly done. And I think that's sort of the general framework that we've tried to Im put in place at Goddard. Um, and, it's, and it's led to a lot of um, what I believe to be short-term success. Um, you know, when I started back in September, we, we were sort of struggling as a program office. We didn't know what we wanted to do. Um, we had ideas, but we weren't necessarily sure what the best value proposition was. And now in just nine or 10 months, we have, om we have over 50 customers um, doing a variety of different development projects. Um, Kyle's gonna talk a little bit more about them later. Um, but one of the ones that I think is gonna be most, most uh, potentially impactful in the future actually is um, it's, a, it's a service called Daphne. Um, so uh, there's a future mission that NASA's launching in 2021 called NISAR, uh, which is the NASA ESRO synthetic aperture radar. It's expected to pull down about 40 terabytes of data per day, which is you know, an astronomical amount to think about, um, 350 petabytes over the five year lifespan. And um, on the flight project side of the house, they looked at the existing systems and infrastructure they had in place, and it couldn't support that kind of workload. And so um, us partnering with a handful of different service providers across center have looked at using cloud as sort of the fundamental backbone for what we wanna do. Um, and we're in the process of, of implementing this um, you know, before NICER launches at the end of 2021. And we're very, very pleased thus far, um, we're looking at piping the sort of raw demodulated signal straight off of the satellite dish into AWS and then processing it all using a series of Lambda scripts. And they're, they're now able to, you know, doing simulation, able to process, like I said, 40, 40 terabytes of data per day for like $200, which is crazy to think about for a lot of us. Uh, and then from there, it'll flow on to the science missions. Uh, so like I said, the overall goal for our service is to streamline and standardize the onboarding process you know, most science and engineering uh, groups that we talk to have uh, very little desire to deal with security. They want it to be simple and easy. Uh, and so I think just simply telling them that that's a service that we can offer uh, to help sort of understand um, cloud security is something that a lot of them are interested in. And so like I mentioned here, um, we're, we're looking at trying to provide that consolidated streamlined service, um, you know, having the, the business processes in place, having the contract vehicle in place. Uh, I joke all the time that uh, our goal is not simply tossing accounts out to people, because if that's our only value proposition, then we're, we're probably doing something wrong. Uh, and so we're trying to move towards that sort of standardized and uh, centralized um, service offering. So something else too, uh, I, I sort of uh, stole it from AWS and they stole it back from the intelligence community that uh, I think is part of our other sort of value proposition. You know, a lot of people expect uh, their account management uh, to be simple and streamlined. Um, we have the contract vehicle in place, but because a lot of people don't understand the cost model, they, they don't want to feel like they're throwing money away or putting money into some black box where they don't have full cost transparency into what they're doing. Uh, you know, I think most people, you know, I'm sure you've all heard it numerous times, the whole CapEx versus OpEx philosophy. It all sounds good until you, know, you are a federal agency working in the constraints of the federal acquisition process, the year to year budgetary cycle with is it O&M dollars, is it R&D dollars, what are the lifespans of those? And I don't wanna feel like I'm putting a bunch of money into some cloud account and I'm not gonna get my money back. So um, you know, there's, there's a lot of expectations and value there to, provi to provide to those customers in terms of giving them that uh, cost granularity and transparency. And then like I said, the biggest one is what we're trying to get to at the bottom with compliance automation. Uh, as, as I sort of joke with a lot of people, uh, I wanna be the sort of Martha Stewart of cookbooks for security uh, on, on our center and, and across NASA. And so we're working with the security team right now to sort of pre-bless some of those recipes so as customers come in, uh, we have sort of those recipes in the book to sort of offer them. Um, and specific around that, I'll, I'll sort of give another customer example that I know, I know Kyle uh, his ears perked up when this came across our desk because um, we're trying to really push the boundary for some of those uh, security principles. Um, so we actually have another future flight project um, coming up that we're partnered with. It's actually not a NASA run mission called CRISM uh, and it's a joint venture between JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency and NASA. And it's their flight project, it's their data, it's their risk, it's their mission. Um, but NASA engineers are trying to collaborate with the, with the JAXA users and so we're actually investigating using AWS Tokyo as the region that's closest to JAXA as a way to sort of have a secure collaboration 
enclave. They're going to do some model-based systems engineering, drawings, and design. Uh, but we're trying to think outside of the box in terms of, you know, must use GovCloud West, must use GovCloud East. Uh, it's, it's hard to sort of tell a foreign partner that uh, it's great, it's your mission, it's your data, and you're a foreign country, but we're going to force you to use GovCloud because that's what our security people want, right? They don't, they don't necessarily want to hear that, so. So the basic principle of what we're trying to do, um, back to this idea about cookbooks, um, we, we, there's a concept that we've, I don't want to call created because I feel like it's been kicked around for a while, but it's this basic concept of a managed cloud environment where we're going to have pre-configured you know, network settings and security settings, account management, and other common tools that we sort of offer as our core service offering. Uh, it's sort of part of the overall cloud shared responsibility model, uh, which if you're familiar with AWS, that's part of their, their basic uh, value proposition. Uh, but we're, we're trying to enhance that. We're trying to say, hey, missions, you don't need to fully understand all the nuances of certain services. You don't need to fully understand all the nuances of network management and security, account management. We're gonna put some of those additional controls and some of those additional sort of design patterns in place. And then, like I said, you can sort of fit into one of those recipes moving forward to help streamline your, your adoption. And then one of the other things that I'll sort of highlight, and this is you know, something that, that I learned at you know, my last agency that I'm trying to pull forward here, is also around the, this idea of common tooling. Um, you know, a lot of projects have very similar needs. They want to use Jira or they want to use GitLab for code and that kind of stuff. And we don't need, you know, 50 customers each with their own managed Jira and their own managed uh, GitLab. Uh, and so we're trying to move to, to this idea of sort of streamlining and standardizing some of those common services. So in terms of the cloud users and use case, uh, we've come up with what I would consider, consider to be sort of three core customer groups. Uh, we have our basic mission cloud customer uh, that, that runs what we call a mock or a mission operations center. And uh, we actually have another group that's coming up as part of our, our Moon to Mars mission where they're going to be deploying a payload to the ISS uh, probably in 2022. And they're looking at doing all the commanding of that instrument uh, from GovCloud potentially. So um, one thing that's interesting about NASA and just the satellite business in general is, you know, they're, they're in orbit. You tend to know what those orbits are. And so like, um, you know, the, the Lambda example I gave before, I don't need servers up and running 24-7 if a satellite's only going to be in view, you know, for 12 minutes every six hours. It's actually the perfect use case for the elasticity because I can spin it up and spin it down as needed. Um, so that's obviously very useful on the, the sort of mission cloud bucket side of the house. On the science side, I think ev everybody can imagine, you know, the need for science users and the need for NASA scientists to be able to collaborate with external partners. And obviously there's a lot of value there with containers and doing big data processing and visualization and a lot of the uh, external partner collaboration with, uh, you know, our, our sort of um, conglomerate researchers across the world. And then uh, we have sort of what we consider to be sort of our, our catch-all use case where we have, um, you know, engineers and other pre-flight activities. Um, you probably don't know what CMNO is since I didn't catch that acronym on this slide, which is just our management and operations. It's your overhead type functions like finance and HR and that kind of stuff. But they still have basic needs that can value, that can be um, of value to use cloud um, around, like I said, the elasticity, the, the ability to rapidly innovate, to spin things up and spin things down. Uh, it's something that I experienced, like I said, at my previous agency that uh, has already been uh, received very well from a lot of our customers. That was a long transition. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll, I'll sort of close my portion and then hand it over to Kyle, and I think we're going to take questions at the end um, that I think is something that has, has, uh, has resounded. I won't, re I won't read the quote. Uh, to you guys and insult your intelligence, but I think you can sort of understand uh, where it's coming from with this idea around shared services um, and what we're trying to do in terms of modernizing uh, across NASA. Like I said, a lot of very smart people that want to do things themselves, but if you understand some of the basic concepts around value proposition and what those customer needs and pain points are, uh, I think there's a tremendous opportunity that we're seeing. And hopefully at some point, like I said, a year or two from now, once NICER launches and we've totally modernized with you know full cloud full cloud implementation of a, of a satellite uh, throughout the course of it, its entire life cycle, I think it'll be um, tremendous. Great, well thanks Joe. And, and NASA is certainly, <laughs> thank you, thanks. It, it, NASA is certainly an exciting customer to work with, with some very unique 
customer mission challenges that NASA faces, but I think the organizational challenges of, of, of transforming your enterprise to one, run in the cloud, and certainly some of the IT challenges are, are issues that other government agencies and other public sector customers and, and, and frankly other large organizations of any industry vertical would probably face, right? The need for, for a security boundary to run your enclave in the cloud, the need to process data at rate, at scale. Uh, these are things that other entities beyond NASA uh, have, have challenges with. And so what we're gonna do for the next few minutes here is talk about some of the AWS capabilities that we're implementing to support the NASA use case that would certainly also probably have applicability for a number of other customers that, that would use AWS in the cloud. So at Amazon, we like to kind of start with the customer and work backwards, right, which is really a requirements discussion of, of what is the customer trying to achieve, what challenges are they trying to solve, and what capability can we bring to bear to address those challenges. And so uh, we've got some building blocks in AWS, right? VPC or virtual private cloud. A number of you that have been using AWS for some time have certainly come across VPC. That's a foundational networking element for resources and assets that you deploy in the cloud. And, and there are a number of other discussions and, and sessions. And, and if you missed some of those sessions at the summit, you can certainly catch them on YouTube. But that, that talk about account governance and strategy and governing your, your cloud environment at scale. But at the end of the day, you're going to have an, an enterprise most likely with multiple VPCs for a number of particular reasons to have additional VPCs. Those virtual private clouds could be part of the same account governance strategy or they could be part of separate AWS accounts. They could be owned by your organization or owned by a partner organization or a, another entity that requires some sort of interconnectivity and collaboration at the networking level. And so certainly bringing the NASA science mission into AWS, the requirement to interconnect these VPCs so that systems can operate at, at, at line speed but also uh, operate securely and efficiently in the cloud but still in their separate VPC enclaves is, is a challenge that we've had to address. And we'll talk about some capability that we've had to reliably secure and, and securely connect VPCs with each other as well as with the on-premises network environment. Uh, the requirements to, to globally scale this out and, and the requirements to, to run this through a software infrastructure as code capability where it's, it's a software-defined data center capability with your VPC in, in, in your cloud networking environment. So let's jump in and look at some of the different connectivity options for a VPC, both connecting to a VPC from on-premises as well as connecting VPCs in the cloud with each other. And, and again, restating the challenge, the requirement to scale across multiple VPCs, the IP addressing challenge as, as a large enterprise like NASA, but of course other entities that, that are, are large institutional type accounts as well, uh, you're going to have multiple physical sites in your environment. And as you come up with your cloud strategy for workload segmentation, the number of VPCs, the subnetting within those VPCs, you're gonna to wanna to have an IP addressing strategy that can accommodate your current requirements, accommodate future growth, with that workload in the cloud, because just like if you look at the pace of growth with AWS, I think that's reflective of our customers' growth with, with their moving of operations to the cloud as well. So, you, so, so think big when you're, when you're planning your, your cloud architecture and addressing deployment. You wanna make sure that you have enough address space to grow to, but also that it, it will route and not, not conflict with your on-premises address spacing. Um, you know, Joe mentioned the Daphne mission and that it processes data downlinked from satellites with a series of Lambda functions. Well, these are thousands and thousands of Lambda invocations that run for a brief 10 minute period. And so if your security requirements require running Lambda within a VPC, as opposed to requiring running Lambda outside of a VPC, you wanna make sure that you can accommodate the addressing requirements for thousands of unique IP addresses for that 10 minute window several times a day as, as satellites fly over their uh, respective ground stations. So various IP addressing options are available to customers within AWS. I think the first and obvious choice is use non-routable RFC 1918 addresses, you know, the 10 dot and the 192.168 uh, IP address ranges and, and those appropriate CIDR ranges. And, and for many institutions, that's an appropriate and suggested choice. Uh, other institutions and other customers may, may have internal requirements to use some of their public address space, but use that in the cloud in a non-routable fashion. 
for, for auditing purposes, for security purposes, if they have the available address space and that's just their enterprise standard to use it, uh, they may have that requirement as well. Uh, and that's certainly supported within, it, within AWS and has been for quite some time. You can use really any IP address space you want as long as it's not going to conflict with the other networks that you'll eventually need to connect to and route, route to and through. Uh, you now also have the ability to, after you've created a VPC with one IP CIDR range, add additional CIDR ranges to that VPC. And there's a link there where, that, that has some specifics and there are some caveats, but you can have VPCs with mixed CIDR ranges where a portion of the VPC is using a, a CIDR range compatible with your internal enterprise network, which could be an RFC 1918 address that you use internally, it could also be a public address that you're using within that VPC. Uh, and you can add additional non-contiguous RFC 1918 addresses. So the use case of that Daphne mission, right, because with assets deployed in a VPC by default are fully routable within that VPC, you could have a certain class of addresses in one VPC that, that are for you know, 24-7 always on systems that require that connectivity back to the enterprise. You could also have a subnet in that VPC using RFC 1918 addresses that, that have thousands of addresses available for those invocations of those Lambda functions that do not require routing capability outside the VPC, but instead may connect to and access an S3 endpoint to pull down data process that data from S3 through a Lambda function, persist that data back out to S3 for further processing down the pipeline. So it's a way to mix IP space within a single VPC to comply with your enterprise requirements, but also have enough available temporary IP space for these Lambda functions to invoke and process that mission data. So that's been a, a kind of a great benefit as part of our architectural plans to support these science missions that have you know, what was it 80 terabytes a day of, of or 40 terabytes a day uh, from the NISAR mission that can be that can be significant to process. Uh, and then recently, within within the past year, uh, AWS now has the ability for customers if they if they have their own public IP address blocks that are allocated to them, if they're registered with the with ARIN, the American Registry of Internet Numbers, or with RIPE, which is the which is French for the in European Registry for Internet Numbers. Uh, you, can, you can bring your public routable IP space to AWS and make that routable within AWS. There's a sh secure registration hand handshake process with the, the, the internet registries where you validate that you own that IP space, but you can then port that IP space. AWS will advertise that IP space on the internet, and you can use your own IP space within your VPC as well as make those publicly routable. So a number of different VPC IP addressing options that, that support that type of connectivity. And then for services within your VPC, right? So you're gonna have potentially load balancers, and these are, when I say load balancers, I'm talking about the, the elastic load balancing service on AWS that is a managed load balancer service front-ending resources running in your VPC for, for load balancing and high availability purposes and, and load distribution. Uh, those load balancers are gonna, by default, have a name within the Amazon namespace that needs to be resolvable to clients on your network. If you have an on-premises network connected to this VPC, if those on-premises clients need to send information to a load balancer in front of the server that they want to connect to, they have to resolve the name of that load balancer, and you're going to probably need at some point name resolution in both directions. On-premises clients need to be able to resolve names within the VPC, and potentially VPC clients need to resolve names on premises, and AWS has recently come out with the Route 53 resolver that enables this. Where previously we'd always had DNS within the VPC, but that your, your on premises clients couldn't use that DNS in the VPC. There were a number of engineering tweaks you could do. I don't want to use the word hacks, but there were a number of engineering things you could do to, to make. Uh, to force name resolution with, with DNS forwarders, and we now have that as a managed service with Route 53 Resolver, and that's, that's enabling some unique mission capabilities in a much easier fashion to support the NASA mission. Uh, endpoint services, you know, also called private link. This has been a, out for, I'd say, about a year and a half or two years now. Uh, the ability, we'll, we'll talk about private link in a second, but that's also supporting some of our use cases that, that Joe has alluded to. 
Uh, and then these are new, frankly, since last reInvent, they were announced and they're now available. Uh, the ability to do su shared subnets as well as transit gateway, we'll talk about here in a little bit. So shared subnets, I think, is a use case that, that promotes uh, some, some great capability for customers. A little bit of an eye chart, I think, at this resolution, but, but here's the console with, with what's called resource access manager where you can define a VPC in account A, and that VPC, of course, will have subnets associated with it. You can share that, you can share subnets from the VPC owned by account A to account B and account C and other accounts within your enterprise. So you could have a central networking team manage and control that network environment, manage and control the IP spacing and the routing of that traffic, but hosts that deploy and, and get an IP address on that shared subnet can be hosts, can be EC2 instances owned by different accounts that you're partnered with. And so it's a way, we use the, the term blast radius, a way to kind of limit exposure. You could put a host on your network, but the, the AWS API activity with that host, uh, the, the billing for that host would be owned and controlled by a separate AWS account with a separate AWS account ID. So a fairly interesting way to support uh, both collaboration as well as a multi-departmental or multi-organizational control. You can securely put somebody on your network, but it's their AWS account that, that's responsible for the charges and the administration of that machine. Fairly easy way to do this with the, the uh, resource access manager, and, and it's a supporting some of our use cases that we're working on. So endpoint services, this is also what was previously and, and still is uh, called private link. It's the ability to have uh, have a service and a server in one account, and you can see on our diagram, the far right of the diagram, VPCB is the service provider, and VPCB, they've created a load balancer that then they can invite account A to connect to their load balancer. Account A accepts that invitation, so there's a two-way handshake for security purposes, but basically you can put an elastic network interface that's mapped to your load balancer in VPCB at the far right into VPCA, they have a secure way to connect just to your server, but not to your entire VPC. So it's a great way as, as a service provider, and, and third-party ISVs are doing this, but now customers can become their own service providers. Uh, so for collaboration, for, for multi-organizational connectivity, or even multi-departmental connectivity within a larger organization, this is another use case to support that, that communication cross VPC, as well as cross account, uh, if, if you want to not grant somebody access to your entire network, but grant them just access to a specific service, but in a secure way without having to go out through the internet, you can do this all within the AWS networking world. And of course, your security groups would also apply to that as well. So, so, so Joe mentioned the requirement to collaborate with other space agencies internationally. Uh, this is one mechanism that could potentially support that requirement, right? And other government agencies are certainly gonna have similar collaboration requirements uh, either with academic institutions or, or government agency one and government agency two and the requirement to collaborate. This is another mechanism to securely uh, enable that sort of communication flow. So when you're designing your VPC, some things to keep in mind, right, is, is logging, the ability to capture that traffic through VPC flow logs. And that source destination, uh, the, the ports, you know, the time, the, the, the payload size, et cetera, you can connect the log and store that connection information, but, but do you have a mechanism to review and, and, and properly alert on that communication? <coughs> Excuse me, so I would just, just call that out is certainly the capability to log is absolutely there, but make sure you have a plan to do something with those logs, uh, as well as uh, consider using endpoints within your VPC. So uh, if you might be familiar with the endpoint for S3, we've had the S3 gateway endpoint and DynamoDB gateway endpoints for quite some time. We also have service endpoints for a number of other AWS services, things like Systems Manager or API Gateway or other services where clients in that VPC can connect directly to that AWS service as opposed to routing out through, through the, the, the outbound egress of your VPC through your network and, and either through the internet or through your organizational network back to AWS. It's a great way to connect directly to that specific managed AWS service. Uh, other considerations, uh, we talked about IP space. Uh, and just make sure that you have a plan uh, for allocating your IP space appropriately. 
Uh, workload segmentation, right? That's back to that term blast radius. Do you put your workloads all in the same VPC for the organization, but on different subnets? Do you put them all on the same subnet? Do you look at having multiple VPCs within the same account or separate accounts, each with their own VPCs and connect those workloads where appropriate? There's not a right answer, I don't think, for, for any particular organization. We're using a combination of these uh, at NASA as well as my other customers. It's really gonna be requirements driven. Uh, what's the requirement for segmentation, for blast radius, for, for, for separation of billing and, and other sort of administrative functions that can help drive how you distribute these workloads in, in a VPC networking fashion. And then of course, keep in mind cost. There, there is a cost for cross AZ traffic, uh, cross, cross VPC traffic, as well as you can log everything, but there's a cost potentially to store and incur those logs. So, so just think through that. The costs are fairly low, but you wanna make sure that you've accounted for that as you're building out a strategy and a plan. So let's jump in and talk about Transit Gateway and, and some, some very specific network connectivity options for connecting to, uh, to VPCs and into AWS. So for quite some time, AWS has had what's called VPC peering, a point-to-point -point connectivity capability for VPCs, and this could also be cross-account, where, where you can connect multiple VPCs with each other, have them routable to each other within AWS but they were not transitive. And so if you had four or five VPCs, VPC peering was a great solution. If you had many VPCs and you wanted full mesh connectivity, you had to manage a full mesh network and that got, that got cumbersome fairly fast. And so we had this capability within AWS and some reference architectures called uh, Transit Hub or Transit VPC. And that some customers have, have adopted that strategy. Uh, AWS now has something called Transit Gateway that's a managed, fully managed service that supports that full, that full mesh uh, transit routing capability. It also overcomes some previous issues with VPC bandwidth limitations uh, and, and it, it addresses the challenge uh, for monitoring and management of that network environment. So Transit Gateway, again, cloud route, a, a fully managed cloud service that supports transitive routing for the VPCs. We show one VPC in this example. Really, there's, there could be dozens of VPCs spoked off of this transit gateway uh, object. It's a routing object that you create. And those VPCs would have that, that full, full mesh routing capability within AWS. So it makes managing multiple VPCs a much simpler, more streamlined fashion, uh, process. Uh, you can see here some of the, some of the key bullet points. Uh, you can have potentially thousands of VPCs across multiple accounts connected to your transit gateway environment. Uh, it's horizontally scalable. The management becomes much easier. And you don't have to maintain individual route tables and individual connections uh, like you did previously with, with VPC peering. Uh, so it's, it's a fairly streamlined way. And a number of our partners in our partner ecosystem have capabilities that now also take advantage of Transit Gateway for their solutions to, uh, to build value and, and add on top of that. So here's, here's another uh, summary of some of the capabilities in that Transit Gateway that, that again, gets you that, that full, full mesh, uh, multiple VPC transitive routing. Uh, it's a centralized point within the region to connect your VPCs to. Uh, we've tested this and had, had throughput of, of speeds up to, up to greater than 50 gigabits per second for multiple VPC or VPN connections that support ECMP. So it's a great way if, you, if your connectivity strategy is VPN, you can now overcome that 1.25 gigabits per second limit of traditional AWS VPN to connect into that transit gateway with, with VPNs that support that equal cost multipath routing. Uh, technology. Uh, and again, the management's fairly, fairly straightforward, integrates with VPC flow logs like you're probably already familiar with. So a fairly simple capability to, to get full mesh routing across your VPCs. Uh, the use case for this, of course, is, uh, is customers that have multiple VPCs, maybe a shared service VPC, and then multiple mission VPCs. Uh, in the case of NASA, certainly missions would be, could be segregated out into separate VPCs depending on the mission, but still have requirements for a common data plane or common security service, auditing service, and common directory services. Uh, this makes supporting those use cases for shared services 
in, in an enterprise much easier. And as your missions grow, as you're adding more spoke VPCs, the complexity of connecting that back to the enterprise becomes much easier because you no longer have to set up a separate private VIF over a direct connect or a separate VPN connection with separate address space to that new VPC. You simply create your new VPC, attach it to that transit gateway that already has that enterprise network plumbing back to the on-premises environment, you're connected and good to go. So it certainly streamlines and makes things more effective in that regard. Uh, another classic use case for transit gateway is edge consolidation. So um, again, centralizing and, and, uh, and streamlining the, the number of connectivity points back to your on-premises environment. So I mentioned Direct Connect briefly, and it's also abbreviated. We use the abbreviation DX. Uh, we, we've had, for the past probably two years now, something called Direct Connect Gateway that has, has significantly increased the capabilities of Direct Connect, where previously you had to have your physical Direct Connect connection at a, at a co-location or a peering facility that was home and it's homed and attached to that region that you were connecting to. And now with Direct Connect Gateway, you can have connections to the Ashburn Colo facility that AWS uses or other Colo facilities anywhere around the country, around the world rather. And with that single connection to that, that, that Colo facility, you now have access to AWS's global network of regions to include GovCloud. So the commercial regions as well as GovCloud, uh, you have access to that from a single Direct Connect location. Certainly, you're probably going to want to have multiple Direct Connect locations for path redundancy purposes, but leveraging Direct Connect and Direct Connect Gateway gives you that global scale for customers like NASA that, that have a multi-region strategy. For, for a, num a number of my customers have multi-region strategies for disaster recovery, for COOP type purposes. In the case of NASA, it, it could certainly be for latency, right? That, that region closest to where that satellite ground station is can receive that data and process that data, you know, 70 milliseconds faster than another region. And in some use cases, that makes a difference. And Direct Connect Gateway can certainly help that connectivity back to your on-premises uh, enterprise environment much easier. So in, in terms of locations where we have Direct Connect POPs or points of presence, Here's a map of our U.S. POPs for, for Direct Connect, and, and these are, of course, constantly growing. Each of these POPs is, is still traditionally homed to an AWS home region, which you can kind of see built out here with, with the lines and arrows. But with the Direct Connect gateway, a physical connection at any of these POPs gives you access to the entire AWS network. So, so the, the advantages of Direct Connect are certainly speed as well as latency. Uh, AWS offers it in one and 10 gig ports, and you can get this from providers. If you want to go, if you want to go first party with AWS, you'll need equipment at one of these POPs, at one of these colo facilities. Uh, you can certainly also get this from your carrier. They can resell Direct Connect as part of their offering as a managed service on top of that. That makes that a little easier, but it's going to help in terms of latency as well as dedicated throughput into your AWS network environment. Uh, so some examples of, of some use cases, and, and Joe mentioned specifically collaboration, collaboration with, with uh, the Japanese Space Agency, where you had their engineers and NASA engineers that had to collaborate on a common project. They, they needed access to a secure enclave that was, was their server environment that was, you know, just for this project they were collaborating on. But, but where, do you, where do you host that environment? Do you host that in NASA's AWS environment and say, come to us? Do you host that in theirs? Certainly connecting the two enterprise networks may be a bit of a challenge. And other customers, you know, put, put, put your own customer lens on and think of, of your organization. A lot of government entities have collaboration requirements with regulatory bodies, or maybe they're the regulator and they collaborate with who they're regulating. Uh, there are a number of collaboration scenarios where this can come up. Uh, you've got issues of data sovereignty. Where is that data physically located? Uh, in AWS, we have the advantage of a global footprint uh, with regions around the world, so that certainly helps in that case. But the ability to have a single VPC separate from both organizations' enterprises that runs just that collaboration server, and now you have the connectivity, how do you get to that VPC securely that will meet the requirement gates of both enterprises? And there's a couple of options for this. We've mentioned private link, right, the ability to have that VPC publish access 
into existing NASA and then the partner organizations VPCs and then they could have their routing connect through their VPC to the service endpoint of, of that private link uh, to get to that server or you can see that last bullet point AWS now has a capability of an AWS client VPN it's open VPN it's a never server rather it's SSL VPN based you can use the open VPN client but it's an SSL VPN that that they can run on their client machines and VPN directly into that VPC not an IPsec tunnel site to site like you did previously but a workstation could VPC VPN directly into that AWS VPC hit that server and and have connectivity and collaboration capability so that's another option that makes makes opening up this access fairly simple and straightforward. And here's a graphic that shows some of that communication flow. Uh, the client on the bottom of that graphic making its VPN connection to that, that secured, secured VPC, and then from there accessing the resources that are exposed to that client from that VPC. So from a performance considerations perspective, as you're, as you're embracing and, and deploying some of these network technologies, what are some certain things you need to be aware of to, to optimize your experience? By default, standard AWS VPC VPN is limited to 1.25 gigabits per second. And that's, that's the managed AWS VPN services. Some customers have overcome that. Uh, they may want to run with certain trade-offs, run software routers on EC2 instances, that would get them more throughput. They would have, of course, to address the high availability considerations they would have with, with running that service on an EC2 instance, as opposed to taking advantage of that managed service from AWS through VPN. If you wanted to step up to direct connect, you can get up to 10 gigabits per second on that private VIF. And private VIF means the connection, the connection from your, uh, your environment directly to a VPC. You can also have four direct connect ports, and it's called link aggregation, but you can lag those ports together and get up to 40 gigabits per second. So if you have high data rate requirements, like some of the NASA satellites do, uh, those are some options that can give you even greater throughput into AWS. Uh, when testing throughput, and when you're, you know, when you're, when, if this is uh, the first instance of, of testing your kind of WAN connectivity to AWS, AWS has the four commercial regions in the United States plus the two GovCloud regions. They may be some distance away in terms of latency from where you're testing from. And so when organizations test this, you have to understand a concept called bandwidth delay product, which, which basically has to do with TCP and window scaling that uh, the further away that is, even though you have a 10 gigabit connection, if it's 50 milliseconds away, you're gonna, it's gonna require more simultaneous streams in order to fill up that 10 gigabits of connection as compared to if those two hosts were very close to each other from a latency perspective. It has to do with TCP round trip, et cetera. Uh, so just be aware of that, uh, that that's, that's a known issue. You can, you can Google that and, and, and research bandwidth delay product and how that would impact these kind of WAN communication capabilities at scale. UDP, because it's a different protocol, it, it handles that a little differently. So that's another way if you're, if you're running iPerf, you can test, you can test over UDP and get a greater view of, of what your connection speed is rated for. Uh, and so with that, that's, that's kind of a recap of some of the technologies that we're using to support NASA uh, and, and certainly some of the unique requirements of that NASA mission and the unique data rate requirements that, that, we're, that we're encountering there. Some related breakouts if you were inter interested in this section. That last one is actually going on right now, so you probably want to connect uh, and, and catch that one on YouTube. But uh, some other examples of other sessions that, that have to do with some of these scientific and, and high throughput computer requirements. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. Uh, there's our contact information for, for Joe and myself. And uh, we've got a few minutes for questions. And two, minutes please, and, two minutes and 30 yeah, seconds. Very few minutes, very, few, very small number of minutes. And then please fill out your session evaluations as well. So thank you very much. Questions? Questions? Yeah, any, any questions? Questions? Do we have any questions for the panel? Kyle and I will linger up front if you if you don't want to ask in front of the group. Looks like we've got one here. Your direct connect map, the gateway, showed the US. Mm -hmm. It's as uh, well populated globally. Yeah, yeah, there's there's I, I the precise number escapes me, but it's well over a hundred. We we've got a very big footprint globally for direct connect. Your major population centers, of course. 
but uh, we've got a fairly significant uh, capability for direct connect. Just about every every continent but Antarctica will have something. Yeah. Any other questions? With uh, shared subnetting, does the is the routing shared as well? I wasn't clear about how that actually works. Yeah, so shared subnetting, ba basically you become a host on somebody else's, or you become a guest, I shouldn't say host, is you, you become a host, a, a guest host on somebody else's network. So you're going to get whatever routing is defined in that VPC. It's just that they don't have the ability to issue AWS API commands to shut down your instance and, and change your security groups, right? They can't do that. You control that. Uh, and and uh, and you would get the bill, right? The account that that owns that would get the bill for that EC2 instance. One caveat with the the shared subnets, they do have to be currently uh, under the same master payer account within AWS. We've got a concept of master payer and child accounts. For shared subnets, they have to be under the same master payer. To attach to somebody's transit gateway, they do not. So so there are some some considerations around that. Uh, the, that, that gets a little tricky. We'd have to, we'd want to confirm in the documentation there are some unique issues there who, in terms of who pays for that traffic, right? Depends on how that traffic's egressing. Sure, thank you. Gentlemen, thank you for sharing that knowledge.